I'm Blaine. Uh, I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. Uh, and uh, so this is a bit of, bit of a philosophical uh, talk. As Boris mentioned, I work at Fission. Um, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Fediverse. Um, <laughs> um, except, like I said, oops, like I said, it's going to be a bit of a, a conceptual talk. Uh, so I'm going to start. The audio is kind of low, so we'll see if you can hear him. Uh, but I'm going to start with my favorite clip uh, with Mr. Herzog here. This is one of my favorite clips ever. Uh, I, I, I really want to dig in in this talk uh, into this tension. I don't, I'm not sure how Claire got this to work so well. Um, I want to dig into this tension between chaos and order um, and, and sort of question what, what we're doing on the internet right now, what our, what our project is. Um, and I'm going to start with, uh, with cheese. Um, <laughs> So I came, I came across a really interesting uh, story uh, of complexity uh, about five years ago, thanks to a couple in London uh, named Francis and Bronwyn Percival, uh, who wrote a book uh, called Reinventing the Wheel uh, about, about cheese um, and, and sort of disrupting our, our preconceptions about cheese. Uh, so the story starts out that uh, raw milk uh, is really dangerous, kills people. Um, it's a great medium for growing bacteria, uh, some healthy and some really bad. Um, and, uh, and that was true until this guy came along uh, and Pasteur uh, invented pasteurization and, and gave us a way to, to sort of kill off the bacteria in, in uh, milk and we could make safe cheese. Um, and the way that that started was around 1900 uh, with Danish butter which is the first uh, cultured dairy product. Is this one going to Okay. Sorry, we'll try this one. Oh, that's much louder. Yay! <laughs> so, Danish butter. Uh, so, the Danish Dairy Association uh, wanted to, to sell more milk and cheese, or to more milk. Uh, so, there was a, a researcher who came up with a way of introducing a culture into this pasteurized milk, uh, which didn't have any, I don't know if we can turn this down at all. <laughs> <laughs> New space. Okay, that's a little bit better. Um, so they, they added a, a culture to milk uh, and created a, a shelf-stable butter. Um, so you could ship it around, tasted good, uh, and uh, unlike previous butter, which had to be sort of home churned, you could, you could sell this in shops. Uh, and it turns out that this is how all cheese is made today, virtually, uh, like 98% of, of all cheese uh, that's stored in grocery stores. And so you get these packets um, 
that you pour into pasteurized milk, and there's different mixes for different types of cheese. Uh, so there's about 40 different types of packets that you can buy from about three companies, and that represents all of global cheese production. Uh, which is crazy, right? <laughs> um, and, and it's great. We can buy cheese that's safe to eat cheaply. Anywhere. Mission accomplished, right? <laughs> Yay, cheese! We all like cheese. <laughs> uh, or is it, right? Um, and uh, in the, this is where the, the sort of story that, that uh, Bronwyn and Francis tell kind of starts. In the 90s, there was this group of farmers in the central Auvergne region of France who live up in the mountains and they milk their cows in the field and then they, they make uh, cheese out of this unpasteurized milk uh, in these wooden buckets. And so in the mid 90s, they were sitting in, in France and they're like, damn, these EU regulators, they're coming for us. There is no way they're gonna let us keep making this cheese because it's definitely not safe. <laughs> um, uh, so, but they, you know, they were like, we've been eating this stuff for hundreds of years. We're not dying. People don't die eating our cheese. What gives, right? We're missing something. So they worked with a university to, to do some research. And it turns out that these wooden buckets are the key. And these wooden buckets, which they never wash, they never sterilize, they don't do anything to, develop a biofilm with a really rich bacterial culture. And that bacterial culture uh, is really effective at cleaning out all of the bad stuff and, and sort of like you end up with good, healthy cheese. Um, and when we compare this to manufactured sort of, you know, nowadays what we would call tra traditional cheese, these farmhouse cheeses uh, have just like an order of magnitude more bacteria and fungal uh, strains in them than the store-bought cheeses that, that have like 20 different types of bacteria. These ones have 200 different types of bacteria and fungus. Um, so they're much better for us. They're much better sort of ecosystems, and they're safe, um, and they taste better. Uh, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting example that I keep coming back to where you know, we've got this Western attempt to control the situation. And we've ended up making things kind of worse, kind of better in some ways, but kind of worse overall. And and it, it kind of looks like it's this tension, right, with, with the, the um, Herzog's desire to control the jungle, uh, <laughs> uh, but his admiration for the complexity of it. And, and I think we're at this point where we, where we kind of need to suss these things out. So the, this cheese example isn't the first nor the last time that this has happened. Um, so we know from Suzanne Samard, uh, who comes from where I currently live in Nelson, uh, <laughs> um, that you know, our understanding of forest ecology is badly broken, right? We've been cutting down these forests and planting up monocultures and, and we're destroying the earth, right? Um, uh, and, and it's really a symptom of our lack of understanding masquerading as scientific understanding. Right, so we, we think that this is ecology. Um, and there's some short-term economic benefit to this, no doubt, um, but the long-term consequences are massive um, and, and we need to figure this stuff out. Um, so those are, those are two examples of what we do to ecology, um, to the world around us, but we do it to ourselves too. So this is a plan of uh, Le Corbusier's uh, uh, Unity de, of uni, Unité d'Habitation, um, which is a, a series of buildings that he built. Um, he's an art, French architect who built these buildings that were supposed to be like 
beautiful, rational places to live, organized spaces. Um, they were they were utopian, right? Like this is this is how people in the future will live. This is like the Star Trek uh, vision. Um, it's the antithesis of Herzog's jungle. It's the thing that Herzog wants really badly. Uh, but spoiler alert, it didn't work. So this is a oops. This is a oh, I've lost it. This is a clip uh, from a film called Coin Out Scotsy of a housing project in St. Louis. I think this video is from the early 70s. And this housing estate was designed using Le Corbusier's model. So they built this gigantic utopian housing estate and then demolished it because it didn't work. It, because the, the community wasn't supported. They didn't build um, a space for people to, to create community. They, they built sort of physical infrastructure for people to live in. And then when they didn't behave the way that they wanted them to, they were like, no, this isn't working, and they demolished it. Um, and, and so this, this sort of modernist movement uh, around Corbusier and brutalism and all this, sort of failed to consider how people wanted to live and failed to consider how people like wanted to interact with each other um, and, and kind of built this idealized version of that without any people and then just like, oh, we'll just put people in it. Um, and Jane Jacobs famously critiqued all of this and sort of modeled uh, um, an alternative on Greenwich Village and, and New York City. Um, and So obviously New York is just the accretion of many years, like hundreds of years of, of sort of human existence and, and creativity and failure and success and all of these kinds of things. And I kind of, I kind of want to know what Herzog thinks about New York, right? <laughs> <laughs> this concrete jungle. Um, uh, so, so we have a lot of, those are just a handful of examples, but we have a lot of examples where, uh, where, we have, where we've seen failures uh, to, where we implement solutions that we think are gonna work, um, and then they, we, we've got an incomplete analysis of the system, and so something bad goes badly wrong because we haven't sort of um, ana analyzed these things properly. So I guess the question is, is Herzog better, like a, when he says against my better judgment, is his better judgment always wrong, right? And, he, and he's hoping to, to cling to this, this sort of understandability um, of the world and, and sort of scientific uh, knowledge. Um, but if our, if our knowledge is perpetually incomplete of the world, then maybe this approach is just bad, right? So what does this have to do with the Fediverse? <laughs> um, and and the, the answer is that control is everything, right? Uh, we're, this is a question of, of where does power lie in our world and, and who gets to decide? So 
I'd like to make the argument that we should give up, right? <laughs> Just let go a little bit. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously, uh, uh, Elon has made some mistakes. Um, but I think that there's a tendency um, to kind of, to want to say, oh, well, we, we, we messed that up. We just need to do better, right? We just need a better understanding. And we just need to make these things more legible. And then, and then next time it'll work. And I'm not sure that that's true. Um, so I, I don't know. Does everyone know what, who Thanos is? No? OK, cool. I, that's great. Um, so this guy, Thanos, is, a, is the, the big baddie from the Marvel films. Um, and uh, his, his sort of like uh, evil in the world is that he thinks that the world's a pretty messed up place. And it's due to overconsumption and, uh, and sort of like environmental degradation. And so he's going to make half of the people in the universe disappear because overpopulation is bad, right? Um, and then the world will be great. So you know, he's trying to act uh, in, a, in a good way. Um, but, but he's assessed that the problem is this tragedy of the commons. Um, and I think if you take a really simplistic view, that makes sense, right? You, if, if the world is falling apart because people, there's too much conflict over, over resources, uh, then you, you say, OK, well, we should have less people. And lots of people will make that argument. Um, and, and I think this is, the, this is the prevailing reaction to Musk taking over Twitter. People are like, oh, but if we, if we go to a decentralized world, then we lose this. Sorry, I should explain. He's got this glove where he can snap his fingers and make half of the universe disappear. Um, and this glove is, is, you know, the right is really afraid of being Thanos snapped out of existence. Um, and, and they should be. We should then I'll step, snap them out of existence if they're you know, bad people. <laughs> I'm all for canceling people um, <laughs> uh, if, they're, you know, if they're bad people. Um, there should be consequences for speech. Um, but the problem is that this power is currently centered in a handful of American corporations. And I, I think if we look at these ecological examples, we don't we don't ever get a good outcome uh, by, by placing the power there. So the good news is uh, that there's the anti-Thanos, or was, uh, uh, and uh, Eleanor Ostrom was a, won the Nobel Prize for Economics. And she, uh, she showed that the, that the tragedy of the commons, that shared resource management, uh, would f that the idea that shared resource management would fail wasn't a thing. That we can manage shared resources, the commons, collectively in good ways. Um, so uh, we just need a few rules. We need some, some sort of ground rules uh, and, and some approaches. So I'm not going to go into these too deeply, but, um, but these are the ones that she came up with. Um, and and it's, just, it's just a, a basis for acting well in the world. So, uh, and I think she goes further and, and basically argues that, um, you know, top-down control absent these rules is actually harmful. So, you know, we always want to act as though we are managing collectively a commons. Um, and I, I, I want to bring in James Scott here as well. Um, so he's an uh, anarchist sociologist um, who, uh, who wants to say, one, there's no panacea um, for, for control. It's, it's not a thing. Um, and he talks about, uh, he talks in Seeing Like a State and Two Shares for Anarchism um, about this tension between the vernacular, so local indigenous ways of knowing, um, and, and then these, these sort of like state, capitalist, scientific ways of, of making the world legible. And, uh, and I think he really speaks forcefully against this idea that, that only by having these legible worlds can we sort of exert power over the world. Um, 
and, and, and tries to argue that you know, these grassroots mechanisms are the way that we should be thinking about, about our world. So, um, so I think Scott really embraces that jungle um, where Herzog wants to reject it. Um, and he talks about this in terms of, uh, you know, the, the um, manufacturing lines and everything. Um, you know, this idea that the machines always have a vernacular element to them. Um, and for the technologists in the room, I think you know, like viscerally, that, you know, yeah, that system's automated. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm part of the machine that's automated, right? <laughs> um, that that there's, there's no way to avoid that vernacular element, right? We can, we can sort of, we can outline and, and document and make scientific all of these things. Um, but ultimately, there is a vernacular element to it. Um, Musk should be an expert at this, right? This is the, uh, the, the tunnel, um, the, it's not the Hyperloop tunnel, blanking on the name of it, uh, in Las Vegas. The boring, the boring tunnel, thank you. Uh, and it was supposed to be a traffic jamless sort of transport system using uh, self-driving cars, um, except the cars weren't self-driving and the stations didn't have enough capacity, so it became an endless traffic jam in a tunnel with no escape hatches. <laughs> um, and I think it just speaks really powerfully to this idea that like, you know, Musk is, this, is this, uh, this person who says like, oh, we'll just bring in this technology and all our problems will go away. And then, oh, but there's a human in the loop. And that human uh, stripped of agency can't do anything to, to sort of fix this situation. So, um, so the, the, you know, Scott says that the more highly planned uh, a system, the, the sort of more it depends on that vernacular. So if we, if we admit that this is true, that we need these vernacular uh, uh, structures and, and, and sort of like ad hoc networks, wh where can we go? What do we do with this? Um, and there is a, a blog post that this guy, Robert Bergeon, uh wrote a couple of weeks ago um, that I think is really uh, salient right now. Um, <laughs> and I really like this, this idea that um, we're trying to run a planetary society that needs to solar punk the fuck out of itself in a hurry uh, on the collective intelligence of an 18th century principality that's heard of the enlightenment from some guy at the pub. So, so he's talking about governance and he's talking about how our governance structures are nowhere near sufficient to deal with the complexity of, of the world that we, that we find ourselves in. Um, and I think if we look to Scott and, uh, and Ostrom and Samard and a whole bunch of others, uh, I think that there are ideas that we can use to, to really build better systems. Um, I am not the person to do that. I have no idea what I'm doing um, uh, when it comes to uh, running and building and, and sort of creating organizations. Um, and, you know, I think in the, in the last talk uh, is a really good example of what we might consider to be like a polycentric organization that's working across a whole bunch of organizational lines to create um, space in our world where we can reason about the things that are happening. I think that's amazing. Um, and I think we need to see more organizations and, and communities like that. Um, and there's a whole bunch of writing on polycentricity and, and how we develop these sort of overlapping uh, communities. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop on, on the, the sort of cultural side of things there because I'm not, that's not who I am. I'm a technologist. Um, so 
I want to talk just for a few minutes about how we, um, how, how we can think about building technology in a way that sort of uh, embodies this, this I, almost indigenous way of thinking, this kind of like letting go of legibility and, and creating more, more complex systems. Um, so this is a little piece of work that, that we're doing right now at Fission. Um, so computer science has two hard parts, uh, cache and validation and naming things. Um, and off by one errors, arguably. Um, I'm not going to talk about cache and validation, uh, but I'm going to talk about naming things. And for many, many years, uh, I've thought about name, the naming things part of computer science being hard as choosing a variable name, right? Um, it turns out that that's not the hard part. Um, so this is going back to Scott. Um, he talks about the legibility of place names and the balance between the sense of place uh, and community that a local vernacular offers um, and the need uh, for emergency services or, or sort of state bodies to be able to, to sort of parse names. So if someone says, help, I'm at the top of Rock Creek, does it mean they're there at the top of Rock Creek? Or does it mean they're at that top of Rock Creek? Because those places are referred by two different communities in the same area as Rock Creek. And there's a top of both of them. Or uh, is it the um, topographical top? <laughs> right? So the, the high point um, there. Oops. Or is it this one that's not on the map that's also called Rock Creek? And, and the state doesn't know, right? The state is ideally someone can just interchangeably be inserted into the situation and go and rescue this person that's asking for help. Um, so uh, to make things legible, the state really prefers this, this lower one, this universal name. Um, uh, and, and these things can be good, actually. Um, but when we think about th naming things online, um, you know, they are a fundamental part of how we interact online. Um, so Web 1.0 created the, D the domain name system, so DNS. Know, Google.com um, and email addresses and, and a handful of others. Um, and, and this was a really good system, works really well. It's sort of decentralized and it, it kind of it works well enough. Um, I think one of our greatest sins in Web 2.0 was ownership of the namespace. So my handle on Twitter, at Blaine, isn't owned by me, right? It's owned by Twitter. And uh, and that means that I don't get to decide what, what interactions I can have with that, right? Um, and there's no, there's no way to, to create new space for those, to, to create new ways of interacting around names uh, using Web 2.0 technology. Uh, Web 3 leaned into peer-to-peer, -peer, um, so going full into the vernacular. Um, but completely illegible sort of wallet addresses. So if you've ever looked at a wallet address, it's just like some hash, some long string of numbers and letters. Um, and it sort of, it goes so far into the vernacular that, that it becomes inaccessible to humans. And it's really like this sort of systems compute thinking. Um, and so we're, we're kind of in a bad place right now. Um, so we're working on a system called, we're calling the name name system. <laughs> um, and it's for, it's for any name. So we're trying to kind of uh, build the sorts of technology, like the sort of system that the, the DNS system provides, uh, but for any name. So it might be your Twitter handle, it might be your email address, it might be a pet name, 
um, any name that you can verify that that's your name. And I'm not going to go into the technology part of it. Uh, some, if you don't get it, don't worry about it. Um, uh, it. It really doesn't matter. The thing that we're really trying to do is find this balance between the, the legible, so being able to, to sort of share uh, names in a global namespace in a, in a you know, the internet isn't uh, a wooden bucket uh, that's self-contained and everything. We're, we're, we're in this global context. And so we need to have some kind of legibility uh, and, and really kind of try and level that playing field with, with the Web 2.0 kind of control um, with integrating the, the pieces of the vernacular. Um, but my, my provocation here isn't to promote a single piece of technology. It's really just to talk about how we're thinking about building these technologies. Um, I, I think we need to, I, I want to ask how can we build systems that result in healthy ecosystems and resist the encroachment of sort of cataloging, encroachment and cataloging of capitalist machinery that benefits only billionaires. And I think that, you know, approaching things from, you know, that kind of ecological uh, indigenous thinking um, can really help us build better technologies for, for everyone, really. Um, and, and I guess the final thought that I'd like to leave you with is, is that in all of this, diversity has been a key theme. So I've used some examples, uh, but the, the context is that there are infinite variations. There's so many different examples and places that I could have drawn these things from. Um, but so it's not enough to build one system that offers an alternative. Um, I, I started this talk saying it was a Fediverse who's who. Um, and obviously, I haven't talked about the Fediverse basically at all. Uh, but, <laughs> but it has been, right? For me, I think that this is, this is the starting point for how to think about the Fediverse and how to think about decentralization. Um, don't think of a mastodon, right? Instead, I hope you'll imagine a, a Cambrian explosion of ways of being online. And, and I think that's, that's the starting point that I, that I hope that as this conversation expands, we can, we can kind of move from. So thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think they've always been there. Um, so, so Twitter, in part, was inspired and, and, and kind of carried on from this thing called TextMob, which we, like some indie media activists and, and myself, wor worked on. Um, and it was, you know, it was designed for protest in, in New York at the RNC in 2004, I think. Um, and uh, Twitter borrowed a lot from, from that experience. Um, I think for, for me, uh, so I, in 2008, I left Twitter uh, over conflict with Jack around what Twitter should be and had built a decentralized version of Twitter that looks a lot like Mastodon. Um, that obviously never went public. 
Um, but, uh, but I think that this, this sort of, you know, building these scientific forests online, building social networks in a, in a way that, that feels like clear cuts and then plantations uh, where we don't have any agency, where we don't have any, any freedom uh, to, to create sort of diverse networks. Um, it's always been inevitable that we were going to get here. It was just a question of when. Um, and, and I think, you know, these questions of disinformation and everything actually make it more acute because where, where does the power actually lie? And we can build, like I think, I think the, the examples um, of fighting the advertisers are super powerful, but it's just one tool and we need a whole bunch of tools and we need a whole bunch of people working in different ways to, to sort of affect these things. So uh, I'm not sure that I can point to like any, any one kind of uh, movement, rather all of them. Um, you know, if we want this world to work, it's like Robin talks about this existential uh, question and, and I think we, we need to figure this out. It's not, it's not, a, uh, it's not optional. Um, I'll try. And okay. I was just wondering, with uh, name name system, uh, where is it today in its roadmap? Where are the challenges, and do you have a pointer that we can go check it out? Sure. Um, so it's uh, I think there's a GitHub org that we've set up. It's very early, is the answer. <laughs> um, uh, we've just started working on it in the last few months, um, and uh, so GitHub. .com, actually, the fission. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll pass it out afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the general model that Fission has been working on is that we convene working groups. Very often we start them, but they're a separate GitHub work. They're not owned by us directly. We welcome people to work on the spec with us. So rather than waiting for top-down standards works, yeah. which themselves have kind of um, calcified, yeah. we're looking to try lots of things. So I think that's yeah. actually to riff on Blaine's message and answer there is it's time to try stuff for governance, for interop, for all of these things. And we can't, sorry, get complacent and be like, oh, I'm just going to hang out in one system X. And some of those things are including things like, oh, naming, if you need to talk across yeah. systems, yeah. we're going to need some levels of agreement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, it's, it's coming. We'll keep, yeah, keep an eye on the, on the fission uh, media channels, and we'll, we'll publish more about it. But. So I was struck by when you're talking about centralization of control and kind of governments running things. I was struck by kind of an aspect of, if you will, Anglo-Saxon history of the, you know, if you go back to like communism, the fights there, what the centralized planning, you know, and the idea was that no, we don't want those big fight against that. We wanted freedom and effectively democracy slash capitalism to win, because then it was a little bit more decentralized. And even back, like the Napoleonic Wars, right? You know, the battle of the British against Napoleon was simply planned and calmed it out. It was a big thing. And I'm, I'm struck by if if we if that model, if, like, if we've always seemed to be on that mission. We, we always seem to swing the pendulum to some centralization thing. Now, I guess, like, Facebook is the centralization thing. It's kind of its own government. Yeah. And it, that's always the struggle, right, that we, we end up Taking up the, you know the, you know the sword and, and going yeah. in. It's like no, yeah. giving. He said, well, it's giving people the freedom to do these things. You know, you see that all the time. I mean, it just really rips to me like that. It seems so similar and eerie the hallmarks of hundreds of years of history. That's that's an excellent point. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yes, I think I, I think that's true. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to do about it, other than continue to try. Um, I mean, I think, I think we just, you know, like, you know, in that in that sense, um, it, it gives us insight into what the threats are, really, and and uh, the give, hopefully gives us an incentive to get ahead of the curve um, before it swings to 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 more negative situation. But it, it also can give comfort in that, you know. Hardly the first, right? right? Yeah, yeah. the last, and, yeah. you know. And there's, you know, there's, you know, hundreds of years of history of people 
fighting the same kind of fight. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's a good point. Thank you. Right, that's a really great point. Thank you, thanks for the question. The question is, uh, so Ostrom sort of writes about uh, resources that are shared that just sort of exist um, a priori um, and not, not like how do we partition or decentralize those resources but actually uh, um, just manage them. And uh, I think that the, the internet is naturally mo monopolistic. So, uh, you know, social networks um, are natural monopolies, um, and uh, and things like you know Google uh, with advertising and search, and Amazon with with sort of online retail and in fact internet hosting. Uh, w we've seen these, these sort of like global monopolies, monopolies way bigger than we've ever seen before, and the challenge with that uh, is that it means that we can't collectively manage them. They're just owned by billionaires. And that's it. That's the end of the end of story. Um, and so, yeah. So it's a necessary precondition before we can even start to talk about governance. That uh, that there are, you know, there are lots of rivers in the world, um, <laughs> uh, and we don't talk about uh, trying to govern all of the rivers together. And so it's just that. I think that's that's kind of the the thing that we're aiming for is like have a bunch of rivers rather than just one. Um, but yeah, that's an excellent point. And um, it's, it's an interesting challenge because uh, we sort of have this, um, this dualism where you know, the, the people who care about governance aren't really working on the decentralization part. And the people working on the decentralization part uh, often aren't thinking about the governance. And so uh, my, part, part of my hope with this talk and, and, and this sort of conversation is to try and bring the two together and, and start thinking about like, what, what's the dialectic there and, and how, do we, how do we kind of push that forward? Thanks. Any other questions? Sweet.